Well, hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about monitoring and testing different aspects of water quality. And I'd just like to recognize um, the people in my research group that are contributing to uh, the information that we'll be discussing today. Um, got an excellent team, including Rosa, who introduced me this morning. And um, also I'd like to recognize uh, the different funding sources for uh, this research work. So the basic issue is that uh, for those of us who are in horticulture, uh, we're kind of in the bottom of the pecking order when it comes to getting access to high quality water. Other users such as um, uh, other industries and especially drinking water have got priority over us. So we're left with less high quality water available for irrigation. And some examples of these lower quality water sources would be rainwater and runoff that we're collecting into catchment ponds and tanks, and also reclaimed water, which is partially treated uh, by a municipal plant, but is uh, generally of excellent quality for irrigation. Now, when we talk about lower quality water, there are several dimensions to it. Most of us are very familiar with some aspects of chemical water quality. Those are the salts, the alkalinity, pH, and ions, and so on, that affect the nutrition of the plant, the salt levels in our containers, and so on. But there are some other important aspects of water quality as well. One of them is the amount of gunk, sediment, particles in our water, which makes up the physical water quality. This has a great deal to do with how clear or turbid um, our irrigation water is. And also, there's the biological water quality in terms of plant pathogens that can cause diseases, algae, which covers our growing media, floors, and so on, and biofilm and microbes that line the insides of our piping, the clog emitters. So the outline of the talk today is going to look at these different aspects of water quality, and I'm going to tag on another topic in here, which is active ingredient level of sanitizers, and knowing whether if you've got a water treatment system in place for controlling biological problems, how to monitor the uh, concentrations and know whether that system is working. So let's first look at chemical water quality. Again, this is what most of us are, have got some familiarity with. Here are some examples of some factors here that we can measure in terms of chemical water quality. These are some problems and threshold levels that we typically uh, use for um, uh, determining whether something's an adequate water quality for irrigation and horticultural crops, and some treatment options. I'm not going to emphasize treatment in this talk, but the very last talk in our series is going to go into that in detail. Now, hopefully uh, most of you have um, downloaded a copy of the handout for this presentation. And if not, uh, Rosa will be able to send you out a copy if you had a late registration. But it had, has a lot of details about these threshold levels uh, for individual ions, um, as well as where to get monitoring supplies, where, where to send samples off to labs, and so on. But just briefly here, let's think about um, a few of these factors. Alkalinity and hardness first. So alkalinity is dissolved limestone. Okay, so the units of alkalinity are in parts per million of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is lime. And so if you're in a, a, um, an area where your uh, bedrock is lime, uh, then as that water, the groundwater, moves through uh, uh, the, the ground and comes up through your well, it's going to be dissolving that limestone in the water. And so if you have high alkalinity, then every time you irrigate with, a, with that water, you're adding lime onto your substrate in your container. So what happens is as you continually lime the, the growing media, substrate pH tends to rise over time. Hardness is a measurement of calcium and magnesium in the water. And a hard water often goes along with a high alkaline water. And having hardness in the water means that there's more likelihood of forming precipitates around small emitters such as drip irrigation systems and so on, leading to clogging. The typical treatment for high alkalinity is acidification. Uh, so you inject an, a, uh, 
an acid such as sulfuric acid, typically a fly in an 85% form, which is com commonly called battery acid. There can also be some balancing of the basic effect of alkalinity with a fertilizer that has more than 25% of all of the nitrogen in an ammonium form. So it's an acid reaction fertilizer. It doesn't matter whether it's a water soluble fertilizer, or controlled release, or granular. It has high ammonium, it'll have an acid reaction. Other options are blending that water with a more pure water source. For example, you may have a high alkaline uh, water from your well, and you can blend that with a better quality water from a municipal supply may be available, or with rainwater. And then finally, there's also reverse osmosis. As well as taking out other ions, reverse osmosis will reduce the alkalinity. Now, pH is often confused with alkalinity. When I ask growers what the alkalinity of their water is, then they'll often tell me, oh, it's about eight. Okay, I've got a highly alkaline water. Well, in the case of irrigation, we want to separate clearly the idea of alkalinity, dissolved limestone, and pH, which relates to the concentration of acid or base in the water. Okay, so pH of our irrigation water doesn't have much effect on the substrate pH, on the pH of our growing media. What it does do, though, is it can affect the chemical activity of many of the materials that we apply um, in horticulture. For example, any of you who are using chlorel, ethophon, as a branching agent, a plant growth hormone, then unless that pH is down around 4.5, you won't get as much activity out of your chlorel um, uh, as you will if you've adjusted the pH of that solution. Okay, so low pH tends to, not always, but tends to increase the uh, activity of chemicals that we apply. There's a nice uh, uh, bulletin in the Griffin Greenhouse and Nursery Supplies website indicating ideal pHs for a number of the pesticides that are available in horticulture. Another thing that happens when pH gets high is that chemicals don't dissolve very well. And so we often need to acidify down um, that pH just to get some of these chemicals to dissolve in our irrigation water. So the main treatment for high pH is acidification. When we talk about salts and water, there could be a number of ions that are involved. It could be junk ions, Na, sodium, Cl is chloride, that are not really used for plant growth. It could be plant nutrients. It could be the alkalinity, calcium, magnesium. Okay, so all of those are going to contribute to the electrical conductivity, or EC, which is used as a measure of salt level in our irrigation water. Depending on the crop that we're growing, they're more or less sensitive to high EC, high salt level in the water. So, for example, if we're growing plugs or liners, we have a need for a very pure water source because they're um, susceptible to salt burn uh, because of the amount of water we're applying in mist. We have certain other crops such as bromeliads or uh, heliotrope, New Guinea impatiens, are also very salt sensitive whereas other, more coastally adapted plants can be tolerant of a high EC. The result of a high EC in the irrigation water is that every time we irrigate, we're adding salt. So the EC in the substrate tends to increase over time. We get salt burn of the foliage or of the root system. And overall, we get a stunting of the plant. The treatments that we can apply for high salt on one hand, we can, again, blend with a more pure water source. We can invest in a reverse osmosis system, which is quite an expensive proposition when you've got a high volume of water, but may be worthwhile if you're just uh, needing high quality water for your uh, propagation area, for example. And on the management side, we can leach by applying extra water to wash out those salts. Now, there are a lot of other ions that could be a problem in the irrigation water. Here's a couple of examples are iron and manganese. Now those are two micronutrients, but when they're uh, available in excess, then one of the uh, common problems is staining of foliage if there's overhead irrigation. So we'll get a brown residue from essentially rust drying on the leaves. There can also be iron uh, reducing bacteria, uh, which cause a, an orangey slime that uh, clogs up emitters. And also, sometimes you get particulate um, 
iron, manganese in the water, which will uh, again cause clogging of emitters. Typical treatments for iron manganese being high in the water would be to oxidize uh, the iron and the manganese, making them insoluble, so they can then settle out or be filtered out. And that oxidation could be with air or it could be with an oxidant such as chlorine. Okay, so let's look at alkalinity um, in a little bit more depth. Increasing alkalinity tends to lead to an increasing substrate pH. So here's some research work from Michigan State University. What they found was when they grew in patients over a 16 plus week period, and they measured the substrate pH, the pH of the growing medium, they had some different qualities of water in terms of parts per million calcium carbonate equivalents for alkalinity. Here's a high alkalinity water from a Midwestern well, 320 parts per million. You can see the pH tending to increase over time. Here is a low alkalinity water in green, which was from a reverse osmosis source. The yellow is where they have um, acidified the uh, high alkalinity well water by injecting sulfuric acid. And in orange is where they've blended these two water sources. And you can see an intermediate pH effect. So in this case, with this experiment, they had a basic reaction fertilizer. It was very low in ammonium and high in nitrate, and the pH tended to increase over time. Okay, so as we increase pH in the substrate over time, what happens? Well, it can lead to deficiencies. And usually, not always, the first nutrient that becomes deficient is iron. Here are some examples. In a poinsettia, there's a normal leaf or an iron deficient leaf, a petunia, and a calibrachoa. What you notice here is that you can see intervenal chlorosis, so dark green veins sometimes, but yellow in between them. So intervenal chlorosis being yellowing, or in some species it'll just turn yellow or white. And you can see that in, uh, when it's extreme, you'll actually get death of some of this young tissue. Iron's an immobile nutrient. It has low solubility at high pH. Okay, the plant's growing, but it can't move iron from its older leaves into the new leaves. So the new leaves come out being pale and iron deficient. So we need to bring pH down in the substrate to make the iron more available. Now, there are a lot of factors that affect pH. We've talked about alkalinity, but you can see on this graphic that there are a number of other factors as well. The amount of limestone and the grind of the limestone, uh, the growing media components, for example, bark and peat tend to be acidic. The plant species, some species such as geranium tend to push down pH. There are other species such as tomato or petunia that tend to push pH up. So we can balance this alkalinity, this dissolved limestone in our irrigation water by injecting acid. Or perhaps we could do that by varying the balance between nitrate nitrogen, which is basic, and ammonium nitrogen, which is acid. Again, any fertilizer that we have, if we look at the total amount of nitrogen, such as 2010-20 has got 20% nitrogen, and how much of that is made up of ammonium? In the case of 2010-20, it's about 40%. Any fertilizer where more than 25% of the nitrogens in the ammonium form will tend to have an acid reaction. It will help to balance some alkalinity. Another issue with high alkalinity waters that are high in calcium and magnesium, is that even if we acidify, as we've got in the top part here, this, this tray of, of poinsettia cuttings, even if we correct for uh, the, the pH issues, we can still have that high calcium magnesium level, which as they dry on the leaves, they can form um, some residues. And that's in comparison with a rainwater irrigation source here, which would be the same with a reverse osmosis, where we have no residues on the foliage. So that's another issue related to alkalinity. Now let's move to pH. Okay, here we've got two different pH levels, okay, around 5 and around 7.5. And, and we've got a solution of, of ferrous sulfate, iron sulfate. You can see that um, it's nice and dissolved in here, whereas it's cloudy and forming precipitates over here. It's forming rust 
at high pH. So the pH of the solution affects the solubility of chemicals and fertilizer in solution. It has a very little effect though on substrate pH. So this concept is very important to understand is the alkalinity that's going to affect the substrate pH. High water pH makes some chemicals less effective and here's an example with chlorine. Here's increasing pH on the x-axis and here is the total percentage of total chlorine in one of two forms. Chlorine at a lower pH has a very strong sanitizing form called hypochlorous acid. At a high pH, it has a weak sanitizing form called hypochlorite. So as pH goes down, we get more and more percentage of the chlorine in a hypochlorous acid form. When pH gets very low, we start getting off-gassing in, in dangerous situations. So typically, we try to stay in the range here of around six to seven and a half when we have a chlorine solution. The effectiveness of chlorination is very much tied to pH management. Now, when it comes to measuring pH, that's something that you can do in your own uh, nursery or greenhouse. It's also possible to measure alkalinity quite simply as well, although most growers send samples off to a lab for that. You want to get a good quality pH meter. And so by good quality, unfortunately, we're talking cost. Very few pH meters that are cost less than $200 are going to be reliable enough to you, for you to make good decisions, management decisions, take actions based on those numbers. You want to have good data to make your uh, decisions on. A number of companies make very good quality pH meters. There are some pH meters on the market sold to the nursery trade that are not good enough quality to use. You also want to have it calibrated um, and calibrate um, at least once a week if you're using it quite often. And you can use that pH meter to measure um, an extraction from the substrate, as in this case, or uh, to measure your irrigation water. Alkalinity measuring is different in that you have a uh, water sample where you add droplets of acid and you count the number of droplets um, to get a color change when this uh, solution's gone down to pH 4.5, when you, there is no more alkalinity left. So the more alkalinity there is, the more droplets of acid that need to be added or injected on a large scale, and the higher the alkalinity. Now high salts, again, can be made up of fertilizers or nutrients, but what we're, the way we typically measure it is with an EC meter, okay, an electrical conductivity meter. And there are plenty of EC meters that are available on the market. It's a simpler technology. Often you can pick a good one up for about $100. So if we have high EC levels, then we will tend to get less root growth and we can actually get salt burn of roots up to which pathogens can easily come in. We tend to get stunting, as in this poinsettia. And you can see here in this pentas and also in the poinsettia here, the lower leaves tend to get a marginal burn, fluorosis followed by necrosis. The leaves are crispy or leathery. They uh, don't expand as much. You'll often get a dark green color, but once the roots die, then the plant's just going to turn yellow. And those are symptoms of high salt. Very simple way of thinking about EC in the growing media is that it's like a piggy bank. You've got a starting balance where you've got, uh, for example, pre-plant fertilizer. You have deposits and you have withdrawals. Okay, so if we have a high EC in our irrigation water, we're depositing salt into a bank account every time we irrigate. So we need to blend it or use reverse osmosis to reduce that amount of deposit. We also don't want to over-apply our fertilizers to combine those two sources of salt to lead to a major problem of salt burn on the roots. On a management side, one of the things we can do to withdraw the salts from building up is by leaching. And so that means that every time we're irrigating, we're allowing some of the salts to uh, be washed out of the pot through the bottom. If you have a very good quality irrigation water and most of the deposits are coming from your fertilizer, then leaching is not required. So here's an example of one EC meter. This is the one that I happen to use because it just takes a very small sample. So this one's good for measuring plugs and liners that I work with, but there are a number of good uh, meters on the market. You can use that EC meter to measure the EC of your irrigation water. 
if you're using water-soluble fertilizers, you can check that the EC coming out of your injector is in line, and also whether the EC in that piggy bank and that substrate is increasing, staying stable, or decreasing over time. Now, when it comes to individual ions and the toxicity level from contaminants in your irrigation water, the symptoms are very similar across a lot of different ions. You can see here in this New Guinea patients, it's the older leaves, which have been around on that leaf for longer to accumulate whatever is in excess, and you'll tend to get marginal burning followed by uh, marginal chlorosis followed by necrosis. Okay, chlorosis yellow, necrosis brown and dead. And so this one happens to be boron toxicity by applying two parts per million of boron with each irrigation, but it could be a number of other nutrients as well. When you suspect that there is a specific ion that is a problem, then you need to send a sample off to a lab, whether it's your irrigation water, the fertilizer solution, or the substrate um, itself. And on page six of the, um, the handout here, it goes through some specific uh, levels, thresholds suggested for individual ions. But normally a, a commercial horticultural laboratory will give you a, a detailed report and even some recommendations. So what problems will arise from these three water samples? Have a look at them here. We've got sample A, B, and C that are representative of three different nurseries. We've got numbers for pH, EC, electrical conductivity, alkalinity, and sodium. So the first question is, which of these water samples would tend to lead to pH increasing in your growing mix for your plants over time? So the answer is sample A. Why is this the, uh, the irrigation source that's going to lead to increasing um, pH over time? It's because it's got a lot of dissolved limestone, 250 parts per million of calcium carbonate. Now, which of these samples would tend to lead to increasing EC levels over time? It's going to be sample C, which has a fairly high EC of 0.9, and a lot of that is being made up of sodium, a junk ion that the plant doesn't need for growth. How about sample B? Well, this is actually a water sample very similar to what I have here in, uh, in my greenhouse. It tends to come out of the tap with a high pH, but it's fairly pure. We add a little bit of water-soluble fertilizer, and that pH goes down very quickly. Because it has very low alkalinity, 39 parts per million, there's very little buffering. So that means it's very easy for that pH to change. We add that irrigation water into our growing mix, the high pH disappears almost in an instant as it reacts with the 